Gearhead 704. Oh, wait, let me try that again. All right, that's a little better. Hello and welcome to Gearhead 704. I'm Matt. And this is my 69 Ford F100 that you guys are seeing right now. This was actually my dad's truck. I have a whole story behind that. So if you haven't seen that on the channel before, definitely check that video out. I'll throw one of those cards. You can just click on that if you are on the platform that shows the cards and you can check that video out if you haven't seen it. But the reason why I just brought it into the shop here and here where I'm at is Fox Mustang Restoration. The reason why I brought it in the shop is I've got Matt here with me and we're gonna go over everything wrong with my F100. Now these videos have done pretty well. We've done them on Fox bodies before. Normally this is a Fox body channel. As you can see we've got FHP to FHP nose to nose. Believe it or not, this one will probably get done first. Well, we'll see, we'll see. But we got usually Fox body stuff going on, but we are gonna do something a little bit different today with the truck. Matt knows a lot about these old trucks as well. And obviously he's just a great mechanic in general. So a master tech, whatever you want to call it. We're going to go through everything that we need to do to the truck. Cause I want to get the truck on the road. I recently got my convertible on the road. So yeah, that's what's going on. Anyway, let me grab Matt and we'll start going through this. See what we got to do to make this thing completely roadworthy. Cause it does have a couple gremlins guys. For one, notice outside it's getting dark out there right now. And the headlights don't even work on this thing. So that's something we got to figure out. Anyway, enough talk. We're going to go ahead and jump right into it. But yeah, like I said, this is a 69 Ford F100. It's actually a long bed. Uh, back then they called Ranger was like a spec on the F100. It wasn't a whole separate truck. Like it ended up being the nineties. We're going to start under the hood though, guys. Cause I know there's a few things wrong under there. We're going to pop that up. Also got Matt here with me. You ready? Yep. Welcome back to the channel again, Matt, okay, for the hundredth time. <laughs> Actually, I do have 250 videos now, so I don't know how many of you've been on, but hey, it might be over 100 at this it point. Be. It's pretty yeah, close. Absolutely. What I know about it, Matt, and we've talked a little bit about this off camera, but I know it's uh, it was a 390 engine, and yeah. um, it's been stroked and bored to a 434, and obviously not stock, right? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff right. we got to deal with. Um, a few things I do know that's wrong, but you know, like like the AC, I don't know if that works. Uh, I know it doesn't have a belt on it right now. And I know you and I had found out too, the thermostat, which I think is right here, right? Yeah. Okay. Got a little bit of light on there for you guys, but yeah, the thermostat right here under full kind of acceleration, we started, or you saw it actually, Matt, what yeah. started happening there. I mean, the gasket's leaking and it's real common. With these type of aluminum cast thermostat housings, these are the cheap ones you see at the auto parts store that's usually like chromed or polished aluminum. They look nice and fancy, but the problem is, is they have problems with leaking, especially yeah. the O-ring styles. A lot of them are made with O-rings now, or like this accessory look kind of uh, thermostat. If they got an O-ring, they're real common to leak. There's all kinds of, uh, I mean, other chrome stuff in here too. I don't know if this, how well this holds up. You didn't see a leak from here. Are these usually no, pretty good? No, no, these, these are usually pretty good. I mean, okay. they're flex hoses. They're kind of made to be a generic hose and also like an upgrade. You can see like this right here, the rubber connector going to the radiator. It's, it's pretty worn. The rubber's starting to delaminate there a little bit. So this we'd probably want to replace because okay. this is where you would have a failure at. One of the things I want to do is I do want to, when I replace stuff, even though dad kind of had it like this, I don't necessarily want to go with the aluminum housing again, mm -hmm. or even like these, these braided spark plug wires, they kind of drive me crazy. I don't know how they uh, yeah. conduct very well or what. I mean, if the wire's chafed, it's going to conduct real well, <laughs> which is what you don't want. Yeah. Not real. Well, yeah. Yeah. Another problem I know about is I just had to replace the battery, which had been several years, mm -hmm. but it seems to be. I have a drain on the system. When I leave the battery plugged in, it might be dead in the next couple of days. Okay, well, we can check for a drain. So what we can do is we can check it for a draw real quick and uh, we okay. can do that with a test light. Oh, and right. Yeah, all you need to do is you disconnect one terminal. So disconnect the terminal. And if you've got a draw, a draw means that there's something drawing power. Right, right? even when everything's off. Right, so there's a flow of electricity. Whenever you got something on, the electricity is gonna flow. It's gonna flow from one terminal on the battery through the entire system, through the load, through the ground, back to the other terminal on the battery. So what you can check, you can check for amperage flow. So even though it's disconnected, if if there is a draw, 
the amperage flow or basically meaning uh, something being on the flow of power will actually light this test light up even with it unplugged yes and the bigger the draw the brighter the light will be oh that makes sense and if the light doesn't come on at all then we don't have a draw all right well, let's find out let's see you can see right there that yep. filament's glowing a little bit i disconnect this it goes away Look at that. All right, so we do have some sort of draw. And, yep. my and it's staying it on. Well, if you notice real quick, like it gets bright for a moment, but oh, yeah, it gets really bright. even after the brightness goes down, it stays on. It's and that's there. what you want to look for. That's actually showing current flow. That's, uh, you know, whatever's on is causing that thing okay. to glow. My dad actually had a theory on what the draw was. Yeah. Uh, he thought it might have been the MSD box being wired in wrong. I mean, I know we'll figure out what it is, but that was, I remember him saying that a long time ago. My dad was in a wheelchair for those of you guys that don't know, so he couldn't fix it. But I remember okay. him complaining about that MSD box. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, and this is one of the older MSD boxes. The newer ones have a plug. We could have just unplugged it, but this one's pretty much hardwired in. So whenever we get down to actually tracing the draw, we may have to actually start cutting okay. or see if there's butt connectors somewhere to where we can disconnect. And the other part too is inside there is like an aftermarket radio, CD player. Exactly. So that aftermarket, could be right. Honestly, after, anytime you get a draw in a car, if you've got an old aftermarket radio in there, you've got a pretty good chance that's gonna be okay. a draw. So maybe I, we'll try that first. Most of the draws that I have found on cars, even when I was working in the general field, was usually old bad radios. Okay. One time I found a penny and a cigarette lighter and that caused a draw. Oh too. man, it didn't start a fire though. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> made the penny hot though yeah i bet what else uh we're looking at though under here i mean so, so like ac system i remember yep. so the belt isn't connected but didn't you say there's some other stuff wrong with it so we're obviously missing the belt and the reason they disconnected it when i turn this feel that matt turn that pulley do you feel how it's like kind of jumpy it kind of wants to grab oh it i did i felt it that time it's not smooth turn it a little bit slower you feel how it's not smooth? There's one time kind of, I felt it jump up, yeah. Yeah, so that should oh, be- Oh yeah, right there. Yes, yep. so that should be nice and smooth. So there's a possibility there may not be much wrong with the system itself. The bearing and the compressor may be bad, which if that's the case, we should be able to actually pull the pulley off and replace the bearing without actually having to replace the compressor. Okay, so but we try that first. I can tell you that right now, it's one of two things. It's either there's a lot of rust built up on the clutch plate or the bearing's gone bad. Either way, we'll definitely look at that. The system looks complete, everything's here. So what we would need to do is make sure that the system has Freon in it. If it doesn't have Freon in it, we'll put Freon in it and then uh, we'll go ahead and start it up and see how it works. That's the best way to figure out how an AC system works is to put Freon in it and see if it works and go from there. Okay. And then you diagnose from that point. All right, Matt, so what else are you seeing here? All right, so one of the things that I noticed is you have a manual choke on your carburetor. Do you want to convert that to automatic choke or do you want to use state of manual? So yeah, that's a good question because I've heard of manual and automatic. Honestly, I don't know what the difference is. I don't know much about carburetors to be honest. So. Gotcha. For cold starts, you definitely want the choke working. And honestly, automatics are just way easier because the manual ones, you got to work from inside the cab. That's that knob that you pull in and out. And you got to remember to open it back up or else you start flooding out. I mean, of course, uh, that's a quick fix, but you know, it's just easier if you go with an automatic. So when you pull it out, is that, uh, what is that doing actually? Cause I know what you're talking about. Yeah, if I remember correctly, pulling it out, you're actually closing the choke plate. What it does is it blocks the air, in, partially blocks the air intake for the carburetor. And when you block the air intake, the suction of the motor is still there. But what it does when you block the air intake, instead of pulling more air, it starts pulling more fuel. In case the carburetor like leaks down or like some of the fuel evaporates out of it, it can cause a hard start uh, or a very difficult extended start. You close the choke when it's cold, it'll start up and it'll run a little rich, it'll run a little high. But then if you forget to open it back up, it'll actually stall, stall the carburetor out. Okay, start, okay. Stall the engine out. Yeah, because I tried the choke one time, I couldn't get it started, you know, and then I had the choke all the way out and it started. But then I kept giving it gas and forgot to put the choke back in because it kept wanting to die. And then it just and then there was blue smoke dying. everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> or not blue smoke, but there was like Probably smoke. Black smoke. Yeah, yeah black just, smoke everywhere. I was like, oh. Dumping gas. Okay. Yeah. So it's meant to just help that initial cold start. And yep. then, okay, then you put, all right. What? Yeah, so the automatic one, the way you hook up the automatic one is you'll just hook a switch power up to it. That wire only has power when you have the key on. So when you turn the key on, when you hit the gas pedal once, it'll automatically close the choke. When you turn the key on, it starts heating up a thermostatic coil inside the choke. It starts banding it, which then pushes the choke open. And at that point, it's running. So directly. it starts out closed and then it gets yes. warm. I think automatic is sounding Right. Better than working the lever. Sure, yeah, and I'm pretty sure we can convert that pretty easily. Okay. So that's not going to be a problem. Take the air filter off. 
And if you've got any leaks on your carburetor, meaning any of the gaskets on the carburetor is leaking, then when we do the automatic choke, maybe we should just rebuild the carburetor. To do it right, you gotta make sure like everything's machined properly. That's how people, most people, whenever they do bowl gaskets, they don't machine the surfaces where the two made up. And what happens is whenever you tighten these four bolts, it starts pulling the throttle body out of out of alignment. Or like it actually starts warping it. That starts warping it over time. So whenever you put a new gasket on, you always wanna have that surface machined flat again. And if you don't do that with it warped, that's why people will put on gasket after gasket and then they'll start throwing on our TV to try to keep it to stop leaking. Oh yeah. And the reason why is because the main throttle body of the carburetor is warped. And it needs to be machined, so that would be is, one thing. Is this the choke do. right here? That's the choke plate. That's okay. correct. Here's your choke cable. See how it like wants to close that? As okay. I push up on that, it wants yep. to move that plate. It'll actually close it. And we can put an automatic on here. Here's your secondary vacuum pull off. Is there a way to tell if the carburetor needs to be rebuilt? It runs the vehicle fine right now, and I'm looking at it. There's no external leaks, so I don't see a reason to rebuild it at this point. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So we'll just go ahead and we can do the automatic, automatic choke, choke and then they'll get that working for you. So we check for any oil leaks, whether it be from pumps, coolants, gaskets, anything like that. We'll probably get a new thermostat housing. We absolutely need a new thermostat housing, absolutely. Okay. Actually, if you look at that, you can see that housing's warped and that's why it's leaking. So that's probably where your leak's coming from. You can the see gap. it's yeah. to the intake here. Yeah, it's bolted down to the intake here. It's bolted to the intake down there, but in between the two bolts, it's popped up. So that could also be thermostats that's out of place. So if your thermostat's slightly out of place and it's yeah. not set into the recess, it actually gets bound up in between the two and can warp the housing as well. Okay. But either way, that's how we're gonna fix that. We're gonna replace that housing. One thing I noticed already is that thermostat looks like it's a lot easier to get to than on Fox body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. It definitely is, that's for sure. Probably do valve cover gaskets if you look right here. Oh, is that the cork gasket? It's a cork gasket. Those and, never leak, right? <laughs> yeah, never, man. <laughs> They're lifetime, didn't you know? <laughs> yeah, you can see you've actually got oil leaking onto your head right here. Yep, I see and that then oil. The, right the header there. bolts on right there. So wouldn't do those gaskets. Maybe they make the blue silicones for these. If oh, they that'd do, be we'll awesome. put those on there. For yeah, sure. they're reusable, right? Yep. I think you got a bad steering coupler. So look right here. You got a bad steering coupler. I'm gonna rock the steering wheel. There's actually supposed to be a chunk of plastic or material right here. You see this piece that's moving with my finger? This chunk right here that's loose. It's actually busted apart. It's called a rag joint, and it's supposed to push in a lot of the steering vibrations to the steering wheel from the steering. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna rock the steering wheel so you can see all the slop in the play right okay. there. Oh yeah. So we need to replace <laughs> that. That's gonna tighten up your steering a lot. It's big time moving. Yeah, like that's, that's pretty considerable slop. So we need to replace that. Pretty typical for the age of the vehicle. Power steering pump's not leaking, your hoses aren't leaking. Oh, wait, no. We definitely have some power steering leakage over here. This would be a situation, because it's all over the place, what we would do is we would clean it up really, and it's not a huge leak, but it's kind of leaking all over the place, so it's a small, steady leak that's been there for a while. So what we would do is we clean this off really good, brake clean or maybe engine degreaser, and then drive it, and then after every drive, watch for the wet spots, okay. and then this way we'll be able to determine where the leak starts, and then that's the component we replace. One good. thing I do know is I I'm missing an overflow top. I don't even yep. know if my overflow even works, yep. actually. Right there. It's empty it's hooked up no it's not oh, there we so go. yeah it's not working <laughs> so yeah your overflow is definitely not working this should be hooked up to the bottom of that tank what's happening now whenever your cooling system does purge instead of purging it into the overflow bottle and then sucking it back in when it cools yeah. down it's just dumping it onto the ground <laughs> so whenever the system wants to bring it back in it's drawing in air Ooh. when these aren't hooked up your cooling system is gradually gonna lower down a little by little. It's never gonna completely empty out, but it'll definitely lower the level. You get air pockets in the system too? Yeah, yeah. what'll happen is the air will, you know, with the engine's not running, the air will sit at the top of the motor, yep. but when it's running, it'll just aerate it. You wanna make sure your radiator cap is working correctly. We'll do that with the pressure tester. Cooling system pressure tester, you got an adapter to put a radiator cap on it. Like I said, I can't read this cap, so usually you can look on the top of the cap to find out what poundage it's supposed to be at but we're gonna pump it up. If a cap's bad, it won't hold any pressure or not enough pressure. If it's good, it'll go up to a certain point. It'll, once you go past that point, it'll vent, but it won't drop down lower. There, it's up to 13. And you heard it just vent, mm -hmm. and it went back down to 13. So this cap's venting at 13 pounds. 13. So it is holding, 
We just yeah. need to see if it's the right cap. And I know you have the service manual, so we can actually look that spec I do, up. actually, yeah. Somebody sent me that. One of my subscribers, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things, Matt, I know on this uh, engine that's really trouble is this is where you change the oil at. The and, oil filter? Yeah, the oil filter, rather. And underneath, looks like, I guess, that is that the K member? I don't know, but I don't even know how to change that, to tell you the truth. Yeah, it looks like you gotta take a bolt off of the end or the end unscrews. That's probably not the regular can filter. If it's I not. had to guess, it's a, it's, a, it's a cartridge filter. Okay. Yeah, you pull, like, it's basically, it looks like a mini air filter, kind of, that you pull out and pull in, instead of having, like, the metal can. But how do you, would you still come from up top then? I guess so, yeah. It looks like you have to, because it looks like the frame's right underneath that, yeah. so, yeah. So, guys, we're going to try the headlights real quick. I don't think they come on at all, or the parking lights, but I'm going to go in, hand the camera off to Matt, and let him kind of look at it and show you guys. This is, should be parking lights now. Yeah, nothing. And then, oh, actually, no, it's headlights. And then there's a knob to turn it on and off, but I got no lights inside the cabin. Okay, yeah, so you definitely, you probably got a blown fuse going to your lights. Yes, yeah, so it might just be a fuse though, you're saying, or? Yeah, I mean, it could be anything from a bad switch, bad fuse, a bad ground, a bad fusible link. All right, well, anything else we need to look at under the hood, Matt? I think up top, it looked pretty good. Like I said, there's not a whole lot to these engines. And even for this year, this is a lot, because it's got power steering and AC. So even for this year, you know, this is a high accessory. Oh, really? This is a high accessory engine. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, as you notice, you, but you don't have power brakes. You got manual brakes. Oh, yeah, brakes. there's no master cylinder there. So fully no, no, manual brakes. No, 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 there's the master cylinder. There's no, oh, no there's power no booster. Power booster there. Okay. Yes. Yeah, but underneath the hood, uh, everything else looks good. There's not a whole lot to do. One thing I did notice is that your, your belt probably need to do belts. When belts go bad, they start cracking in between the ribs. You can see those right there, like the lines yep. going from side to side there in between these two bumps so that's the belt starting to break down that one's not horrible it probably won't break on you like in the next couple hundred miles but at this point they are considered worn out and okay. i would recommend replacing them so we've got thermostat housing thermostat uh, we got to figure out what our drain is mm -hmm. we got belts so power steering leak we're gonna check on valve cover gaskets yeah automatic choke the automatic choke which is gonna be a nice upgrade right and then we need to put a belt on the ac and charge the ac to see if we can determine what's wrong with it it does look like this had original r12 so we will need to retrofit this okay all right well maybe we should get underneath next we're about to move under the vehicle we're going to show you what we find under there and obviously the truck's too big to get on matt's lift so that's why we're just put it up on jack stands and jacked it up but anyway i'm gonna go ahead and invert you show you what we can see under there so now we're under the vehicle i don't see any additional leaks there might be a little bit of a water pump leak but it's directly below the thermostat housing that we know is leaking so we'll do the thermostat housing first that's nice and easy i think your water pump's leaking too okay i just noticed if you can see where that light is right there yep i see the material from here in the blue right yep. here uh-huh that's a separator plate gasket so that's a thin metal plate on the back side of the water pump and that gasket right there that's definitely leaking coolant so yeah we're doing a thermostat housing and our water pump other than that the rest of it looked pretty clean up front here so while we're underneath it what we need to do next is we're going to check the suspension and steering is there any movement you see this this pivot point right here that's called a kingpin setup all right so instead of ball joints it's just got a shaft that the whole thing spins on anywhere there's a ball and socket which is going to be a pivot point like right here yep if it's worn out, that's gonna have that play in it. There's no play there. So you see all this fluid over here coming oh, yeah, off this a area of right here? Yep. I'm thinking your power steering gearbox is leaking. So to fix that, we just replaced the whole gearbox. And it just bolts to the frame. It's actually not too bad to do. Overall, man, I mean, even for the age, this thing's in really good shape. Okay, back up from under the truck. And now I'm going back under again because I'm pretty sure we have a transmission leak. We're gonna get back there, check that out. So going back under. All right, coming up underneath, and it's kind of obvious to me, this is a transmission right here that we yeah. do yep we have a leak definitely have a leak i'm looking on the front we got some oil leaking coming down the side of the motor and around the front of the transmission it's definitely oil because that's black and i can see it the line dripping from the valve cover up top a lot of times you know when people think that they have a rear main seal because there's oil at the bottom of the transmission or the bottom of the bell housing always check your valve cover gasket a lot of times it's not going to be a rear main it's going to be the oil leaking from the valve cover all the way down and collecting around the transmission but this right here this is a pan gasket that's leaking you might have a selector shaft seal leaking as well and what that is, that's the seal on the side of the transmission from the shifter 
goes into and then okay, yeah, I noticed and there's some right there. Is that yes. what you're talking about? Yes, that's okay. exactly. And it looks like that's a pretty good leak. So we're probably gonna have to do a selector shaft seal. Definitely gonna do the oil pan gasket as well. Transmission pan gasket, okay, yeah. my bad. And then when we do that, we'll do a transmission service as well. Automatic transmissions have filters as well, but they're not like an engine. They're actually bolted to the transmission inside the transmission pan. So you gotta drop the transmission pan. It, filter is usually held in by two of the three bolts. You take the bolts out, throw a new filter in, put a new pan gasket on, fill your transmission back up, and you've done a transmission service. No, but underneath, I mean, this is a, you know, you oh, I see one thing. We got a radius arm bushing no good. See this right yeah. here? That's a suspension bushing. It's called a radius arm and it connects the I-beam suspension and stabilizes it to the frame. Well, it's very common for these bushings to blow out, so we'll just have to replace that it's as well. It's probably only 50 years old, Matt. I don't so, know why that's a problem. Yeah, you got your money's worth out of it. But yeah, other than that, we'll be looking at transmission service, probably selector shaft seal, radius arm bushings, and kingpin setups, and suspension should be good unless you want to go ahead and throw shocks and springs in just because they're so old. Yeah. The springs, I can guarantee you they're bad. I know they were lowered at one point, but that would happen in the 90s, so I think yeah. at this point, I'd rather just go ahead and replace them. Might still go a little bit lower though, who knows? We'll see. Never yeah. On the exhaust, I noticed it looks like we don't cross over anywhere. Yeah, there's looking no back nice. pipe or it's straight pipes all the way back. So is that okay on these old engines? I mean, it's really okay for any engine. It, okay, just, equal, it? it just equalizes the exhaust sound. So guys, yeah, while I'm under here, just want to show you kind of the condition. This truck is 50 years old and it was driven and it's all original pretty much. Uh, but you can see the rust really isn't that bad. I'm showing you guys around here. So yeah, we are probably going to replace the shocks. But yeah, exhaust wise, we're looking good. and. Anyway, I want to get out from under this vehicle. Back up from under the truck, uh, the up and down, my back is not liking that. If you're not sure what I'm talking about with my back, check the last upload, the last video. But anyway, the truck looked really solid underneath. I was really happy about that. Uh, how, just how solid it was, like very little rust. Um, the tires, we got to talk about the tires, guys. So these tires, even though they look good, they are actually quite old. I think maybe they were replaced in 2006, <laughs> maybe? <laughs> I don't know, they're pretty old. Gotta get new tires. We're gonna go ahead and get new shocks underneath and also probably some new springs. Matt found a lot of bushings, that kingpin setup, that was new to me. There are a few other things still wrong with the truck, so let's finish those up. But really what I'm doing here is I'm making an entire list of everything I need to do because I actually wanna be able to drive this dependably. Something I didn't mention yet though, guys, when I drove it over here that day, I had smoke pouring here out the back. Out the back on both sides, uh, probably from the brakes. So I think the brakes were partially engaged Maybe some sort of issue with the e-brake, I'm not sure. But we have manual brakes, four-wheel drum. So we got drums in the front, drums in the back. We're just gonna go ahead and do a complete brake job as well on this. I mean, it makes sense, right, to go ahead and do that. We're gonna do that. Uh, Matt's gonna show us a couple more things that he, we need to fix on this. Let me grab him and we'll kind of wrap this up. You guys were thinking maybe it was uh, the fuse at first. Matt's found us a headlight switch. Yeah. Do you wanna show him the fuse uh, thing right there? Yeah. So he's gonna show you guys the fuse box. And the there she is. We got a real old school setup here with the glass tube fuses. Yeah, and I noticed there's actually a wire going into the fuse but Matt you told me that's something you've seen before yeah a lot of people whenever they want to tap into a power source they'll just like jam it in between the fuse and the fuse block that's really not a great way to do that I would never do that we'll end up pulling those out and wiring that stuff correctly but you're also looking at my headlights while you're down yep, here so the biggest thing that I noticed the reason your headlights aren't working they're not plugged in oh <laughs> the switch isn't plugged in but I found out why is this right here is the wire for your rheostat for the da dimmer for the dash lights. So I will pull that switch out and you can show people what's up. All right, so Matt actually got the uh, headlight switch out, which yep. that block you were showing plugged in there. Correct. This little tab right here will usually rub up against this coil, which is what this wire is. This wire should be coiled like that all the way around. And as you turn it, it increases or decreases the resistance, which brightens or dims the instrument cluster light. And so whenever I stuck my hand under there, it was already unplugged and I noticed that this was hanging loose. So they had it unplugged because it kept popping and kept shorting fuses because of this. Place to start first is we need a new headlight switch. Then after that, hopefully everything works. If not, this is still the first place to start and then we diagnose from there. But really, most of the stuff that we found is just basic stuff that's worn out over time. There isn't anything major that you saw that's like, oh my God, this is a disaster. Is that right so far? Uh, yeah, I mean, the truck for being that it has been a driven and used truck, you know, it's been modified a couple of times, 
but overall for its age and being that it has been used, it's in great shape. That's awesome, that's great to hear guys. When the Fox Doc says that, you feel pretty good about it. I don't know if we can say it. What are we calling you now, Dr. Fox Body? I don't know, we've got to figure out a name for Matt. <laughs> you go by Matt, don't you? You just like Matt. <laughs> I'll answer to that. Okay. Yeah. Well, guys, that's pretty much the drivetrain. We covered most of that. Uh, Matt and I were just talking about the rear end off camera, but when we go to rebuild those drum brakes in the rear, uh, we'll take a better look at that, take a look at our seals and stuff like that. So, well, now we know what parts we need to order. I know how to have headlights at night. We think, we think we're gonna try that, but that's pretty cool. So yeah, I guess that about covers it then. Thanks a lot for all the help going through it, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. And there you have it guys, everything wrong with my 69 Ford F100 that we know of so far. I'm sure there's more, but really I was kind of impressed like Matt said, for it to be that old and have been used actually over time, it's in pretty good shape. I'm pretty happy about it. I know some of you are definitely looking for truck content and we finally brought you some. So this is the third video on the truck. It's enough for me to start a playlist. So I do have a playlist on all the videos on the truck. If you wanna check that out, the link is down in the description below. You can check out the playlist, see how I got it, why it means so much to me because it was my dad's truck, how I got it back, and kind of all that. But yeah, next thing for this truck is really just those maintenance items and then I can drive it. I'm already driving my convertible, which Tar Heels is outside, but I'm gonna be able to drive this as well, which is pretty exciting. I wanna be able to just take one of the nice cars out. I've got a 69 Ford, I got an 89 Ford. That's what the convertible is, an 89. And at one point we had an 09. We had an 09 Expedition. We eventually replaced it. You know, it's kind of cool. I guess I need to see what they're gonna come out with in 2029. So nine years from now, Ford, make sure you do something really good. Or wait, we're really close to 2021. Eight years or so, maybe seven. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> but that's pretty much it for this one. Big thanks to Matt here at FMR, Fox Mustang Restoration for helping me out. They normally just deal with Fox body stuff. In fact, they sell tons of restoration parts. Look at this warehouse, just full of restoration parts for your Fox body. So definitely check them out if you haven't already. I have a link, always have a link down to them in the description below, along with my 10% off code that never changes, code GEARHEAD704. But yeah, that's it for this one. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button. If you're stopping in for the first time, please subscribe because I do upload two times a week. And I've got plenty more videos coming on that FHP back there, which is mine, as well as the truck, as well as Tar Heel, just all kinds of stuff coming to the channel. And we'll see you here next time on GEARHEAD704.